Okay, we are now live. Okay, great. I'll pass the floor to Rafik Al Bailey. Okay. Good day, everyone. We are now live and welcome to the grand final for the second annual edition of Taylor's Internal Mooting Competition. On behalf of the organizers, I would like to thank everyone for joining us today. My name is Rafik Merzok and I'll be the bailiff for this session. With me today is Teng Yvonne and Sai Priyasha as the assistant bailiffs and Carmen Lee as a timekeeper. We will commence proceedings once the judges are ready. Judges, are you ready to begin? Uh, Mr. Arvi, Ms. Nicola, you are ready? Yeah. Okay. Thank All you. right. Um, first counsel for the plaintiff, you may begin. May it please the court, my name is Liu Lok I represent the plaintiff, Mr. Alfie, alongside my learned co-counsel, Ms. Ng Min Chak. My opposing learned counsels, Ms. Tan Ying Yi and Ms. Naomi Ku Xin Yi, represent the defendants. Ms. Grace, the first defendant, Mr. Thomas, the second defendant, and the daily newspaper, the third defendant. The plaintiff makes three submissions today. We are reserving 18 minutes for the first and second issue, 12 minutes for the third issue, and five minutes for rebuttals. I will be submitting the first and second issue. My co-counsel will be submitting the third issue and the rebuttals. The first issue is whether the plaintiff has satisfied the requirements for defamation against first and second defendant. The second issue is whether the third defendant can be held vicariously liable for the second defendant's report. The third issue is whether the defendants may successfully raise a defense of justification and fair comment. Would your lordships like to be reminded of the facts of this case? Um, yes, please. The plaintiff was the managing director of a company where the first defendant was an ex-employee. At the time of first defendant's voluntary resignation, she alleged in a scandal that she was constructively dismissed and had wrongly accused the plaintiff for being the reason behind the dismissal. Recently, when the first defendant was interviewed by the second defendant, a journalist, concerning the plaintiff's inappropriate tendencies, she accused the plaintiff for not respecting her privacy and bodily autonomy, resulting in an alleged constructive dismissal. The second defendant jumped at this chance and published scandalous report to the third defendant's daily tablets and websites to the public at large. I shall now begin my submission. My lord, the plaintiff has suffered serious harm to his reputation because of the defendant's defamatory statements, which caused the plaintiff to be humiliated and embarrassed, whilst his standing and character as a managing director of Shelby & Co. were critically tarnished. Counsel, uh, how many points do you have for your first submission? I do have... For the first submission, we do have the liability for libel and slander. And is that your only point? Is that yeah. your uh, because my question is how many points do you have for your first submission? We have for the first points. issue, yeah, three points. Okay, proceed. On the first issue, it is submitted that the requirements for defamation against first and second defendant has been satisfied. The plaintiff will first address the claim that both first and second defendant are jointly liable for libel followed by the claim that the first defendant alone is also liable for slander. Second defendant is liable for libel as defamatory words contained in the report were published by him in permanent form on third defendant's daily tablets and website. He used the defamatory headline that reads, Alfie can't keep his finger to himself and quoted the first defendant's defamatory speech in his report. Regarding first defendant, despite her having made the defamatory statements orally, she's jointly like responsible for the libel. The case on this point is the court of appeal case of Dr. Kong Eng Leong and Tan Sri Haris bin Muhammad Saleh, where the court referred to D.B. Vijandran and Kapal Singh and held that where the defendant gives a statement for publication or in expectation that it would be published, he becomes responsible for a republished version even if it is an edited version. In D.P. Vijandran, we cited Carter Rock on libel and slander, where an individual gave an interview to reporters intending that the defamatory statements would be published even if it is an edited version, the individual shall will be liable not only for slander in publishing the statements to the reporter, but for in libel in that he authorized the publication which subsequently was made in the newspaper itself. Applying this to the present case, the plaintiff's action against first defendant takes the form of libel as first defendant had maliciously intended to use, permit or cause the third defendant to publish the defamatory report against the plaintiff. The first defendant well knew that the second defendant were present at the interview as the investigative journalist of the third defendant conducting the interview and that the first defendant's defamatory statements against the plaintiff would ultimately be published to the public to the third defendant. 
First defendant should or ought to know that the words spoken by her, owing to its sanctional, scandalous nature and content, would be picked up for republication by the second defendant. My Lord, I shall now proceed to prove the elements of defamation for libel against the first and second defendant. The case of Dr. Shai Asman bin Shai Aman Nawawi reiterated the three elements of defamation. Firstly, the statement is defamatory. Secondly, the statement refers to the plaintiff. And thirdly, it has been published. On the first element, it is submitted that the words used by the first and second defendant are defamatory. The case in Dato Suri Muhammad Nida bin Jamaluddin, which is a court of appeal case, referring to the case of Sheikh Hussein Ali, acknowledge that this element is satisfied when the words have a tendency to lower the estimation of the plaintiff in the minds of right thinking members of society, so that the plaintiff is avoided, shunned, or ridiculed. These defamatory words are defamatory in its natural and ordinary meaning, as well as by way of a false innuendo. Firstly, reading the report as a whole, the words of the headlines and the first defendant's quote were indeed defamatory of the plaintiff in its natural and ordinary meaning as it attacked the plaintiff's character and reputation, cast expressions on his integrity, and certainly had a tendency to lower his esteem in the eyes of right-thinking members of society. The plaintiff pleads that these words meant the following. The plaintiff is a pervert who could not refrain himself from touching the first defendant. The plaintiff is disrespectful to the first Wait, defendant. Come, 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 sir. Where does it say in the statement that it was the plaintiff himself who had touched the defendant. By referring to the headline and the first defendant's quote, combinedly, it shows that the Yeah, but the, the who was responsible for the headline? Mr. Thomas, isn't it? So I'm a bit so you're relying on, on the headline. Um, and the argue quote. that that the, the first defendant is liable for for making the defamatory remarks, but who's responsible for making the headline? Is it Mr. Thomas or is it the editor of the newspaper? The second defendant is responsible for the headline, but the first defendant is responsible for the quote. But, but um, when I ask you which portion of the statement is defamatory, you are saying you refer to the headline and you're reading the headline together with the quote, but uh, the first defendant is not, not responsible for the headline. So, how can that the statement that she made, the quote seen in isolation, be defamatory? Because the first defendant's quotes were cited in were quoted in the first second defendant article. Okay. That, that goes back to my question because my question was reading the quote alone, um, where does it say that Alfie, the plaintiff, was was the person responsible? for violating um, the first defendant's bodily autonomy. That was my question. And then um, in answer to my question, you said that um, we can infer from that by reading the headline, but the first defendant is not responsible for the headline. My Lord, I see that we are not on the same page. May I it's, my, it's my lady. It's my lady, and, sorry. Yes. My apologies. Uh, no, uh, yes, we are not on the same page. So you have to convince us. How is it that uh, Grace's statement, the first defendant's statement, um, amounts to defamation? Her statement amounts to slander and also libel because she's spoken the words in the interview. Uh, which goes back to my question. Um, how, how are those words defamatory? The words are defamatory by way of true innuendo or false innuendo. Those are all legal principles, very abstract legal principles. Try and apply it to the facts. Um, factually speaking, when, when I look at the passage, uh, nowhere in the passage does, did she refer to uh, Alfie as the person who violated her bodily autonomy. There are external facts that can prove that the plaintiff Referring to the plaintiff, which I will be addressing later. Can you address it now? Yes, sure. Yeah. Um, in the present case, the external facts do exist as the plaintiff is the managing director of the Shabi and Co, which is understandable as the head of the company. It is also proven that the fact that the defendant one words are defamatory as the plaintiff head was mentioned in the court. Furthermore, these facts are known by the second defendant at the very least which the words are published too. So 
So you're relying on innuendo instead of natural and ordinary meaning. Is that the case? I am relying, the plaintiff is relying on both the ordinary and natural and also innuendos. Yeah, but if it's ordinary and natural, then we shouldn't be looking at external facts, right? We should only be looking at the passage itself. The external facts is for the innuendos. Okay, so, but how can you convince us that the passage from its natural and ordinary meaning would be defamatory? In, by, reading that, by reading the quotes and the headings together, we can infer that... Okay, so that's your only point, that um, if, if it's natural and ordinary meaning, you need to read the quote and the header together. Yes. Okay, yeah. Move on, move on. All right. Much of that. Secondly, relying in regarding in Randall's, the court in Sheikh Hussein Ali allowed the plaintiff's claim alleging the impugned word were defamatory by way of innuendo. It was held that by inference or implication, the words convey the meaning that the plaintiff was inter alia, dishonest, a subversive element, and ungrateful. In the present case, the headlines that read Alfie can't keep his finger to himself is a parody of the idiom can't keep one hand to oneself, and the word fingers meant to be a combination of Alfie and fingers. It gave rise to a false innuendo, which read together and or all separately with a first defendant's quote, were understood to mean that the first defendant could not withstand working in Shelby and Co. and involuntarily resigned because of plaintiff's disrespectful conduct towards her, including making inappropriate physical conduct. On the second element, it is proven that the words refer to the plaintiff. In Sanderson and Million Times Limited, it was held that the headlines and article following were defamatory in their ordinary and natural meaning, and the plaintiff was clearly pinpointed in the article so as to be instantly recognizable by those readers of the newspaper. Applying to the facts, the plaintiff's name was cited in the headline. There is no doubt that the words or statements contained in the report referred to the plaintiff. The third element of defamation means disseminating the defamatory words to a third party other than the plaintiff. Since the defamatory words were published to the third defendant's daily tablets and websites, this element is satisfied. In short, the requirements of libel against the first and defendant are satisfied. Proceed to the issue of slander by the first defendant. The defamatory words the plaintiff claims as slander after by the first defendant in the, in the interview to investigate the plaintiff's personal life and, in, and inappropriate tendencies within the office space is set out as follows. I was not fired from Shelby & Co, but I may as well have been. How can you expect me to work in a place where my own privacy and bodily autonomy is not respected? A virus like this starts from the head and makes its way down to the chain of company. The plaintiff submits that special damage need not proven for the first defendant's slander in the present case as the statutory exception of slander in relation to a person's professional or business reputation provided by Section 5 of the Defamation Act 1957 applies. The defamatory words were clearly calculated to disparage the plaintiff in his office as the managing director of Shelby & Co. As first defendant had clearly mentioned the name of the company and address the plaintiff with the word the hate. Hence, section five is applicable. My lord, my lady, I now proceed to prove the elements of defamation for slander. On the first element where words must be defamatory, first defendant's speech in the interview is defamatory by way of both false and true in rando. Firstly, first defendant's speech is defamatory by way of false in randos as by inference or implication, it conveyed the meaning that first defendant involuntarily resigned because of plaintiff's sexual misconduct towards her at work, and that the plaintiff is an unethical superior and spreads the culture of sexual misconduct between the company. Next, first defendant's words are defamatory by way of true innuendos, a special knowledge of facts which are known to the recipient of the publication causes the word to be defamatory of the plaintiff. It is submitted that the recipient of the publication, second defendant, possesses special knowledge regarding the fact that the plaintiff is the head of the Shelby and Co and the scandal which the plaintiff and the first defendant was heavily involved with. As an investigative journalist who investigates about the plaintiff, second defendant would have basic knowledge that the plaintiff is the managing director prior to the interview. Besides, the fact that the second defendant had invited first defendant to the interview for investigation infers that the second defendant knows of the scandal. Hence, even if the words appear innocent to ordinary people, it would appear defamatory to the second defendant due to his special knowledge. Relying on true innuendo, the plaintiff has to first prove that there exists external facts other than the words by the first defendant, and these facts, which must be proven combined with the first defendant's words, are defamatory in nature. 
Secondly, the facts must be known by one or more persons to whom the defendant's words have been published. And lastly, the knowledge of these facts may cause the words to be defamatory of the plaintiff in the eyes of reasonable men who are privy to the special facts. In the present case, external facts do exist as the plaintiff is a managing director of Shelby & Co, which is understandable as the head of the company. It is also proven that this fact combined with the first defendant's word are defamatory as the plaintiff is the head mentioned in the first defendant's quote. Furthermore, these facts are known by at the very least the second defendant whom the words are published to. The knowledge of these facts may cause the word to be defamatory of the plaintiff in the eyes of reasonable men who are privy to the special facts. A reasonable man with the knowledge of the scandal and that the plaintiff is a head of Shelby & Co will find first defendant's words defamatory of the plaintiff. More so, the second defendant knew the background of the plaintiff. On the second element, the words did refer to the plaintiff. The three factors determining whether words refer to the plaintiff set down in Chiu Siu Khan and Sunny Bui is fulfilled since there exist proven external facts which link the defamatory words to the plaintiff. The words were published to second defendant who had actual knowledge of those external facts and that imputing knowledge of these facts to a reasonable man objectively. He could come to the conclusion that the words indeed refer to the plaintiff. Lastly, the third element of defamation is satisfied since there was publication of the defamatory words by the first defendant and the second defendant. My lords and ladies, to conclude the plaintiff's submission on the first issue, the requirements for defamation against the first and second defendant is satisfied. Proceeding to the plaintiff's submission on the second issue, whether the third defendant can be held by Clarice liable for the second defendant's report, there are two alternative grounds. Firstly, in the context of defamation action, prima facie, vicarious liability principles do not apply in the line of court of bail and high court cases as seen in IP Bank Berhad. And also in desiree culture. In this submission, the plaintiff refers to the case of desiree, which cites RHB Bank, that referred to the control test in Honeywell and Stain and Luckin Brothers as the applicable test in determining whether the person is an independent contractor or a servant or agent. If the employer determines what is to be done but retains the control of the actual performance, the doer is a server or agent. Whereas if the employer prescribes the work to be done and leaves the manner of doing it to the control of the doer, the doer is an independent contractor. In desiree, the first defendant was a clothes manufacturer and the so-called servant of the first defendant in the alleged master and servant relationship was a debt collector appointed by the first defendant. The debt collector was held to be an independent contractor as the first defendant does not retain control of the, over the debt collector. On the facts, it was proven that neither the first defendant nor the debt collector had determined the manner in which the debt collection services were to be conducted. However, uh, hold on. Um, yeah, fine and well, you're going through the, the relevant principles of law. So what is the point that you're trying to make here? Um, is Mr. Thomas an employee or an independent contractor? The point to be made here is Mr. the second defendant can be an cannot be an independent contractor if distinguishing with the case stated in the submission. You are citing a case so that you can distinguish it to prove a point that he cannot be an independent contractor. Do you have a case that, that, that says that even if a person is not formally an employee, if he is in a relationship that is akin to an employment, um, then uh, vicarious liability can be established? My apologies, my lady. Due to my research, I could mm. not find any case that relates vicarious liability and defamation that is can be held liable. Mm. No, not 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 really defamation per se, but uh, any tortious liability because I think the general principle would apply because um, defamation is a tortious action. So contextually, if you have any other case where the court has had uh, the court, not only Malaysian court, maybe UK courts have held that. Um, uh, a company can be liable for vicarious liability for the conduct of an independent contractor who has acted uh, in uh, akin to an em employee of the company. So I think um, that would be helpful, helpful for the court as well. My apologies, I could not find, I, I did not include the case in my submission. You say you did not include the case in your submission, but are you aware of any relevant cases? Yes, my lady. And can you uh, give an example of a case that you're aware of? May I have a moment to consult my notes? Yeah, sure, sure, yeah. Much obliged. In 
the case in the case that I mentioned just now, which is desired culture, the following passage from Pakistan Corporation Sanjan Bahad, the ninth edition, was cited in support for the proposition that the newspaper company ought to be liable for its own act of publication. It mentioned that any person who has authorized or participated in the publication of a libel is treated as publishing the libel and hence is liable in its own right. Thus, if B writes a book and A publishes it, A is liable for its act of publication, whether B is his servant or agent or neither. The position is the same when newspaper A publishes an article or letter submitted by B. Uh, that is not a case of vicarious liability, is it? It's a case of defamation. So the publisher is taken to be the uh, primary thought feaser. Yes, my lady. So it's not a case of vicarious liability. Yes, my lady. Mm, okay, so you have no other cases? No. Okay, yeah. Do you have any other points in your submissions? Uh, I would like to distinguish the case that I mentioned with the present case. Apologies for interjecting, Liu Yi. Your time has run up. Would you like to ask for additional time from our Lord and Ladyships? Um, my Lord and Ladyships, due to time constraints, may I request for an extension of two minutes? Uh, Mr. Arabin, Ms. Nicola, is that okay for you? Two minutes? Yeah, yeah that's fine. Yeah, all right, okay. So, on the second ground, the plaintiff urged the court to consider that the circumstances of a present case are different. The differences are in the line of cases where vicarious liability principle does not apply. None of the relationships were between the alleged master-servant relationships are similar to the present case. In desiree, the relationships were close manufacturer and debt collector. And in RHP Bank Bahad, the relationships were banks. Therefore, in the present case, the relationship is a newspaper company and an investigative journalist. The purpose of hiring the second defendant as an investigative journalist was for him to deeply investigate a single topic of interest, which is the plaintiff, and prepare a report for it to be published. The aim of hiring the second defendant was ultimately to make a publication, unlike in Desiree, whereby the engagement was to carry out a debt collecting which is natural and ordinary circumstances would not involve the circulation of certain flyers that are defamatory. Unless I can assist your lordships and ladyships any further, this is the end of my submission. My learned co counsel will now address your lordship and ladyship on the third issue. Much obliged. Thank you, counsel. May it please the court, my name is Ng Chia. The third issue concerns whether the, the defendants may successfully raise the defenses of justification and fair comment. I shall now begin my submission. The plaintiff submits that both defenses are ought to be inapplicable in the present fact situation. Beginning with the defense of justification provided by Section 8 of the Defamation Act, there's no burden on the plaintiff to prove the falsity of the defamatory publication as the law presumes defamatory words to be false. The authority for this principle is the case of Tan Sri Haris bin Muhammad Saleh and Dr. Shari Isa. However, the burden of proof lies on the defendants to prove his allegations. The defendants have to prove the truth on the balance of probabilities, that is, the allegation is more likely than not to be true. This principle is stated in the case of Dr. Sri Muhammad Nizar bin Jamaluddin and System Television Malaysia. If the defendants fail to satisfactorily prove the truth to this honorable court, it naturally follows that the defense do not apply. The court in the case of Dr. Sri Nizar had stated the principle that an allegation published by repeating a rumor cannot be justified by proving that there was such a rumor. Instead, the substance of the allegation must be proven. And in another case of Abu Hassan bin Haspula, it was emphasized that allegations must be substantially justified by proving their precise truth. Turning to our present case, the plaintiff submits that the defamatory implications are unfounded allegations based on two grounds. Firstly, the language in the headlines of the report stating that the finger, my apologies, I'd like to rephrase myself, the language in the headlines stating that the plaintiff could not keep his fingers to himself had imputed to the readers that the plaintiff had inappropriately touched the first defendant when there was no evidence that led was led that this was so, and not to mention that the first defendant had never ever stated that the plaintiff had any physical advances towards her during the interview with the second defendant. And secondly, the quote provided by the first defendant during the interview was merely based on a scandal. The first defendant's accusations that the plaintiff had disrespected her privacy and bodily autonomy, causing her alleged constructive dismissal in the interview, did not necessarily mean that the accusation has been proven on the balance of probabilities, because in actual fact, the defendant had voluntarily resigned from her position. 
the plaintiff refers to the court of appeal case of Gui Tong Hyang and Bu Cheng Hao on this point for the principle that the defense of justification by showing tenuous circumstantial evidence and inferences cannot be sustained. In the present case, since the police report was withdrawn and no further investigation was done on the matter, there were no and as well as there were no legal actions taken to the court in order to substantiate the precise truth. The plaintiff here was never charged with any offence or, or have been convicted of sexual misconduct or for disrespecting the modesty of the first defendant. And there was neither a judgment from the industrial court finding that the first defendant was constructively dismissed. Hence, there's no solid and substantial evidence to sustain the plea of justification. In addition, the second defendant cannot justify it by saying that he honestly believed that what the first defendant said was true and repeat what the first defendant had said in his report as an honest belief. This principle is stated in the case of Abdul Rahman Talib and Sini Basagam. Therefore, the plaintiff urges the court to consider that the plea of justification should fail. Sorry, counsel. Um, I know you said that there was no other civil uh, decisions or criminal decisions in favor of the defendants, but is it not open to the defendants now in this action to prove the truth of her allegations? My lord, yes, the defendants may prove, but they have to they have to show substantial proof in proving the precise truth. What do you mean they by substantial truth? Proof. So balance of probability or beyond reasonable doubt. What do you mean by substantial proof? There must be a specific offense or charge. Why so? Precise oh. truth in as mentioned in the case in the case of of Abu Hassan bin Haspula, precise truth means that the specific offense or the charges must be that were alleged to be true by the defendants must be proven precisely. For example, if the defendants had still a watch, it's not enough to prove that the, my apologies, I'd like to rephrase myself. As an, as an illustration, for example, stealing a watch is not enough to prove that the plaintiff was guilty of another offense, though the, the offense is the same character for example, stealing a clock. If the, the words impute that the plaintiff stole a watch from another person, it is not enough to prove that the plaintiff stole a watch from another yeah, person. I, I'm sorry, I don't see where you're headed towards with this. My apologies, my lord. May I rephrase myself? Yeah. I would like a moment to gather my thoughts. Much obliged. My Lord, in order to prove the truth, the defendants have to, have to spec specify which part of the statements were said to be the truth. The charges, they have, they have to prove the charges or offenses that they allege to be the truth. Okay, what to, exactly do they need to prove? As in just say... They have to identify and particular particularize which part they they have thought of the statement to be false. Uh, yeah. Sorry, so they need to prove their statement, that's what you're saying. Yes, my lord. The quote. Okay. Yes. And in that quote, I, I don't see anywhere where it was alleged that uh, your client had committed a crime. You see my point? There's a fact that has been alleged. And whether that fact can be proven or not, shouldn't it just be uh, based on the uh, balance of probabilities as opposed to anything higher than that? Yes, my lord, it has to be proven on a balance of probabilities and they have to prove the precise truth that they were talking about. They have, it's not up to the plaintiff to convince the court that whether the plaintiff has com committed the charge of criminal offense or tort of sexual harassment or misconduct, it is up to the defendants to specify that what they allege this, what they allege to be the truth from the statement. Okay, assuming they have crossed that 
uh, legal burden of proof. Wouldn't that shift the evidentiary burden back to your client? I mean, I'm just dealing with the principles here. We're not going into the, the actual proving or disproving of the facts itself, because I think that would require a trial of the action. Yes, my lord. My answer on this is yes. Okay. My lord, may I proceed to my next? May I proceed to my submission? Yes, please. Much obliged. The plaintiff now proceeds to the defense of fair comment provided by Section 9 of the Defamation Act. This defense is not absolute and can be defeated when there is malice on part of the defendants when publishing the defamatory statements. This principle is set out in the case of Abdul Rahman Tali. The plaintiff submits that the defense of fair comment should in any event fail as the defamatory statements were maliciously made by each of the defendants. The plaintiff will be proving actual malice against each of the defendants in the order of the second defendant, third defendant, followed by the first defendant. And my lord and ladies, it is submitted that um, the second defendant... Sorry, um, so the fair comment cannot be used if the comment was made maliciously, right? So can you identify precisely um, the evidence that you're using to support your argument that the comment was made maliciously? Because when I looked at the facts, I cannot find any um, obvious evidence of... Um, a malicious intent on the part of the defendants. My lady, it was stated in a line of cases that malice can be inferred by the court from, from facts of the situation. It can actual malice can be proven by in by inference. In the present fact, okay, situation, but, but we can cannot just infer something out of the air. There must be certain facts that are available to us, and then from those facts, then we make certain inferences. So what are the facts that you're relying on? Much obliged. Firstly, I'm relying on the, on the fact that the publishing of the report was actuated by an act of sensationalism, motivate, motivated by a dishonest and indirect motive by the second defendant. And secondly, the second defendant had been indifferent to the truth of the published words and had not done any prior verification with the plaintiff before publishing. Are they, required, um, are they required to do verification because they are not raising the defense of qualified privilege? I know that uh, the duty to verify, um, it's, it's a prerequisite if they're relying on the defense of qualified privilege, but this is a defense of fair comment. Yes, my, my lady, the for the defense of fair comment, Malice defeats fair comment as well. Hence, no, I'm looking at the, the you, you are saying that the failure uh, on the part of the defendants, particularly, I guess, the second defendant is seeking clarification from the plaintiff. Uh, that fact alone, or rather from that fact, you can infer that the intent of publication is malicious. So um, is that the correct position of law? Because they are not raising the defense of qualified privilege. Qualified privilege, the... Publisher is required, or uh, one of the things that the court will consider is whether or not the publisher had sought clarification from the uh, from the subject of the defamatory uh, statement. Uh, but this is the defense of fair comment. Is uh, is it a requirement for the publisher to first seek clarification from the plaintiff? My, my lady, I'm much obliged. I, on this point, I would like to cite the case of Tansri Haris bin Muhammad Saleh, which referred to the Supreme Court case of S. Pakyanatan and Jenny Ibrahim. The court held that publishing defamatory statements with the failure to contact the plaintiff for verification of truth constitutes a proof of actual malice. My lady, I would like to bring out the facts of this case in order to apply it to our present fact situation. The court in this case found malice on part of the first defendant, regardless of his effort in carrying out his own research to ascertain the truth, apart from the materials given to him by another person. The first defendant here was never bothered to inquire or give the plaintiff an opportunity to reply to the serious allegations of corruption by simply assuming that the plaintiff was going to be biased, although it would not have been difficult to locate the plaintiff or to write to him for his response, since the plaintiff in this case is a prominent person, a businessman. And hence, the court inferred that the first defendant was motivated by malice since he deliberately omitted to do what ordinary sense of fairness required him to. And returning to the plaintiff's submission, on reasonable and probable grounds, malice can be inferred on part of the second defendant as he had failed to verify or inquire the truth with the plaintiff, the managing director of Shelby & Co., 
who as a prominent person could be easily contactable. And it is no excuse for the second defendant to avoid carrying out verification by reason that the plaintiff was going to be biased simply because the matter relates to his own. In addition, the plaintiff submits that a reasonable or prudent man would have been careful and made further inquiries before publishing such a report. He did not do so because his desire to exaggerate the negative news to attract readers outweigh his sense of caution. Apologies for interjecting, Anin Chia. Uh, your time has run up. Would you like to request for more time from our lady and lords? My ladies and lords, may I request for an extension of two minutes? Mr. Arvid, Mr. Kolata. Okay. Yep, I have no issue. Yep. All I'm right, much obliged. Proceed. And since the third defendant has so failed to verify the allegations with the plaintiff before authorizing the publication of the defamatory report to a wide spectrum of audience, Malice can also infer. And lastly, the plaintiff submits that Malice can be reasonably inferred against the first defendant on two grounds. Firstly, there was evidence of personal spite towards the plaintiff. And secondly, there was an indirect motive to make use of the interview occasion. On the first ground, the plaintiff would like to cite the case of Yi Tong Hyang, which cited Abdul Rahman Talib, Court of Bill case, which recognized the principle that the existence of malice may be proven by extrinsic evidence outside of the libel itself. For example, it may be expressions of personal spite, ill will towards the plaintiff. It can be anything which shows that the plaintiff and defendant lived on bad terms, whether before or after the publication. My lords and ladies, it is submitted that the first defendant had previously lived on bad terms with plaintiff as there was evidence of expressions of personal spite and ill will against the plaintiff. It can be inferred from at the time of the first defendant's resignation, she baselessly accused the plaintiff of being the reason for her resignation being involuntary in a scandal. This shows that she held a grudge against the plaintiff long before the publication. And onto the second ground is submitted that the first defendant had taken advantage of this interview and exploit this occasion to revive the scandal again after a year. This amounts to a dishonest and, dishonest and indirect motive of making use of an occasion for some indirect purpose, which is inferred as malice based on the case of Abdul Rahman Talib. The first defendant here had withdrawn the police report and had not taken any legal action during a period of a whole year, but she had only brought up the matter recently at the timing, exact timing when she was interviewed. The matter had been already settled amicably. And since the police report was withdrawn and no legal action was taken, hence it can be inferred that it was actuated by some indirect motive which constitutes malice. In summary, the conducts of the three defendants have clearly evinced the presence of police, which defeats the defense of fair comments. My lords and ladies, to conclude the plaintiff's submission, on the first issue, defamation is established, and on the second issue, the third defendant should be held vicariously liable for the second defendant's report. And on the third issue, the defense of justification and fair comment are ought to be applicable to the present case. Therefore, the plaintiff prays that the court awards general and aggravated damages in respect of the first, second, and third defendants' defamatory acts and an injunction to forbid continued publication of the offending statements. Unless I can be of any further assistance to your lordship, these are my submissions. I'm much obliged. Thank you, counsel. Um, first counsel for the defendant, you may begin. May it please the court, I'm Naomi Kusin E, appearing on behalf of the defendants, Ms. Grace, Mr. Thomas, and the Daily Newspaper, thereafter mentioned as TDN. Alongside my co-counsel, Tan Ying E, defendants respectfully reserve 15 minutes for issues one and two, and 15 minutes for issue three. I will be addressing issues one and two while my co-counsel will be addressing issue three. Five minutes will be reserved for sir rebuttals. Before I proceed, would the court require the facts of the case? Uh, I don't think so. Yeah. Much obliged. Moving on to our first issue, which is whether Alfie has satisfied the requirements for defamation against Miss Grace and Mr. Thomas. The defendants submit that Mr. Alfie has not satisfied the requirements for defamation against Ms. Grace and Mr. Thomas on two grounds. That one, the statements made are not defamatory. And two, reference was made to Mr. No reference was made to Mr. Alfie himself. My lord and ladies, the defendants will now move on to address and submit the first ground that the statements made are not defamatory. We will be solely focusing on true and random. However, in response to the plaintiff's submission for Ms. Grace, Given there's no reference to Mr. Alfie, no explicit reference, such statements would be in actual fact, not defamatory. If they were, it would be directed towards Shelby and Co, not defamatory to Thomas, as Thomas has relied on scandal here. And for Mr. Thomas, there's no natural and ordinary meaning for the word fingers in Mr. Thomas's statement, and hence not defamatory in its natural and ordinary meaning. 
my lord and ladies, um, moving on to true in Rando, where the three elements to be satisfied were laid down in the case of R. Mugesson and the Straits Times Press case. So applying this test, the statement is not defamatory through vi um, via a true in Rando for Miss Grace, as scandal cannot be qualified as an extrinsic fact to be relied on. This is referring to the Dato Suri Anwar bin Ibrahim and the New Straits Times Press and another, and reiterated in the case of Ling Kifung and Kong Wa It for Press Berhad. So here they mentioned that the standard to be adopted when determining whether there has been defamation is that of ordinary reasonable people of fair intelligence who are not avid for scandal and should not be unduly suspicious. So although this quote was stated during the investigation of Mr. Alfie, what is material is solely this quote. The rest of the conversation cannot be taken into consideration as it is not in the mood problem. So given this present situation, people who apply the scandal as extrinsic facts to comprehend the meaning of virus are not reasonable persons, and hence the claim that the statement is defamatory via true innuendo would fail as it is only defamatory to said group of unreasonable persons. Furthermore, applying this test to Mr. Thomas, the claim that the statement is defamatory through true innuendo is, will fail too, as aforementioned, scandals may not be considered as extrinsic facts in establishing a true innuendo. Thus, any meanings formulated by relating the headlines of the report, and I quote, Alfie can't keep his fingers to himself, which is perceived to be a pun on the phrase, can't keep one's hands to oneself to the previous scandal of Mr. Alfie and Miss Grace is invalid. Further, it was held in the case of Garda Communication and Normala Samsudin that when considering whether a statement is defamatory of a plaintiff, it is necessary to consider the article as a whole. Applying this law to our present situation, only the headlines of the report is stated in the moot problem. Headlines in newspapers are often construed to attract the reader's attention, but might which might be why this headline provides some room for imagination. As the plaintiffs have earlier mentioned, the headline must be read together with the report to be defamatory. Thus, having no knowledge of the content in the report, no assumptions should be made with regard to the whole publication being defamatory towards Mr. Alfie. Moving on to my second ground, which is no reference was made to Mr. Alfie himself. Here, the test in determining whether reference to plaintiff was made may be found in the case of Abdul Khalid, that Khalid Jafri bin Bakar Shah and Party Islam in Malaysia and others. Here, reference to plaintiff need not be made by name, provided the words are designated to be understood by reasonable people to refer to the plaintiff. It is sufficient if those who know the plaintiff could make out that he was the person referred to. Here, applying this case to Miss Grace's statement, the word head is vague. There's no explicit mention of Mr. Alfie's name, much less his position as managing director in Shelby & Co. There are no other facts in this statement itself that support, that lead people to make this inference. As such, even if there was a reference, the word place mentioned, and I quote, how can you expect me to work in a place where my bodily autonomy and privacy is not respected? This place would then refer to Shelby & Co. and Rehan Berhad and not Mr. Alfie. Moving on to Mr. Thomas's case, in the case of Chu Siu Kian and Sunny Boy Muhammad Ismail, even though the plaintiff's surname and age were mentioned in the newspaper, the courts were of the opinion that it is not defamatory. Hence, applying this to Mr. Thomas's situation, the mere mention of the name Alfie without his surname or his age or whatsoever quotes related to his job in Shelby & Co could have been said to constitute sufficient reference to Mr. Alfie. Apart from that, it is not clear whether Miss Grace's quote was included in the article as only the headlines of the report are provided. Thus, no relationship between the stated Alfie and Shelby and Co can be inferred to assume that it is our pla present plaintiff, Mr. Alfie. My Lord and my Lady, this concludes the defendant's submissions on the first issue. Now, moving on to the second issue is whether TDN can be held vicariously liable for Mrs. Um, Mr. Thomas's report. Yes, my lord. Uh, okay, you mentioned that the quote was, was it in the report or not in the report? Was it reproduced? 
The facts are silent on this case, my lord. As such, we may not um, make assumptions about that. Okay. May I proceed, my lord? Uh, yes, yes. I was under the question. impression that it was actually reproduced in the report itself. Thanks for pointing it out. Much applied. So moving on to the second issue, the defendants submit that TDN cannot be held vicariously liable for Mr. Thomas's report on two grounds. First, that Mr. Thomas is an independent contractor, and two, Mr. Thomas's act does not fall within any of the exceptions where an employer is liable for an independent contractor's tort. My lord and my ladies, vicarious liability is established when three criteria are met. This is stated in the case of Tan Eng Siu and another, and Dr. Jackie Singh Sipu and another. So on element one, um, although we previously submitted, although the defendants have previously submitted that there is no defamation as there is no defamatory statement. However, provided my Lord finds for the plaintiffs in issue one, the tortious action here would be defamation. As such, we shall proceed to discuss the other elements on the basis of such possibility. Moving on to element two, which states that there must be a special relationship recognized by law between the person alleged to be vicariously liable and the tortfeasor. In the aforementioned Tan Eng Siu's case, special relationship may be established by some tests. And here we will apply the control test, which was previously laid down in the case of Short and J&W Henderson Limited. Here, four requirements were stated. The first one being the power of selection of employee, the second, power in determining uh, salary or other remuneration. From... Yes, my lord. Sorry, I, I was pretty sure I read it somewhere. So I read through the mood problem again. Can I bring you to the line right after Grace's quote? The first line. Yes, my lord. Uh, do, you, do you have it with you? Can you just read the first sentence? Yes. Uh, Mr. Thomas, the investigative journalist of TDN conducting the interview, Halt on this opportunity to publish a report quoting Grace on such a sensational scandal. So doesn't that show that that uh, quote was actually reproduced or quoted rather in the report? And Lord, I beg to defer as here it was merely stated that they quoted Grace on such a sensational scandal, but there was no mention that that exact statement was actually quoted in his report. And there is no evidence to show um, that specific statement was actually uh, made in the report. Um, okay, I, I disagree with that, but uh, <laughs> if you want to proceed on that basis, by all means. Much um, my lady. No, what um what what I just wanted to say is that um it I'm I I'm I'm reading the the quote uh, that is given in it. Um, yeah, I, I, I basically agree with what uh, Mr. Aravin has said, um, that it, it basically says that a report quoting Grace on such a sensational scandal, and I'm reading at the facts again, there's no other quote other than what was read just now um, that was given by Grace. So I don't see how, how it can be said that it, it, it was not given in the report. My lady, but, I beg... Yes, I'm sorry, my lady. Um, my lady, I beg to defer. As, um, as stated here, it is an interview. And in interviews, normally a series of questions will be posted towards the interviewee. And as such, we, may, we have no substantial evidence in this provided in this moot problem that can lead us to infer that the statement is 100% um, the same statement as mentioned earlier, which quoted Ms. Grace um, in the start of the moot problem. Um, May I continue, my lady? Okay, counsel, let, let's put it this way. Assume for a moment now that we are on the, the same page, the judges are on the same page, that that quote was the very quote that was published in the report. What do you have to say? Can you address us based on that? Because we are not interested in other points. Yes, my lord. So um, would you like me to address it in terms of the defamatory statement or reference to plaintiff? Anything, whatever points that you have from now on, just address it on the basis that that quote was in the report together with the headline. Alfie yes, can keep his fingers to himself. Okay. Yes, my lord. As such, um, I will refer you back to our arguments previously mentioned that 
Such statement, even if it was included in this report, the statement itself is not defamatory as no reference was made to Alfie and the, and the true innuendo, which people might, um, people might gather that this statement is actually defamatory, the extrinsic facts that they rely on would be the scandal itself. The scandal, as aforementioned in the earlier part of the moot problem, which involved Miss Grace and Mr. Alfie. As such, I... Yeah, wouldn't, wouldn't people who, who work at Shelby be aware of these extrinsic facts, which would be relevant in establishing in Rando for the purpose of affirmation? Yes, my lady. Um, referring back to the case that I quoted just now, extrinsic facts do not include scandals. As such, scandals may not be relied on as extrinsic facts to prove that there has been true innuendo. I'm, I'm trying to understand the reasoning behind the case that you mentioned just now, that extrinsic facts do not include scandal. Uh, why? Because I, I don't quite agree with uh, the reasoning because um, effectively in, in the case of innuendo, uh, you either the facts are helpful to establish whether or not one can tell that the statement refers to a specific person as well or, or, or whether one will see the statement as being defamatory. Uh, so how does that lead to extrinsic uh, scandal cannot be used as, as extrinsic fact? What's the rationale behind the case? My lady, as stated in the case of Dato Suri Anwar bin Ibrahim and the New Straits Times Press, here was stated that um, the standard to determine whether there has been defamation is that reasonable people, they are not a bit of scandal. As such, scandal, um, a reasonable people, a reasonable person, sorry, a reasonable person would not have relied on scandal to come to such a defamatory meaning. Um, my lady, um, I see that we are not quite on terms on this issue. May I proceed with my uh. submission? Okay, um, you, you, were, you were submitting on the issue of vicarious liability, isn't it? Yes, my lady. Right? Okay, so what are your points? Can you briefly just set out your points? Yes, my lady. Um, our two main grounds are that Mr. Thomas is an independent contractor, and the second one would be that even when he is an independent contractor, such act that he, his act does not fall within any of the exceptions where an employer is liable for an independent contractor's tort. This is in reference uh, okay, to- Okay, um, Right, so, so your main point is that he's an independent contractor. Uh, yes, my lady. That is your primary point, right? Yeah. Yes, uh, are you aware of the case of Cox and Minis Ministry of Justice? The, yes, I think it's a UK Supreme Court case. Yeah. Can you address us on that point? Because I'm quite convinced to expand the law on vicarious liability in Malaysia. So- and, and I'm quite persuaded by the reasoning of the Supreme Court in that case. So can you please address me on that point? My lady, um, as referring to the case of Cox and Ministry of Justice, um, there was this part um, in essentially that they did what sort of relationship has to exist between an individual and a defendant before a defendant can be made vicariously liable in the tort of the conduct for the individual. So here, um, I would refer you back to the control test whereby we can establish that the degree of control that TDN has over um, Mr. Thomas is not sufficient enough to categorize him as an employer. And as such, he, he has this certain degree of freedom in his work and thus establishes him as an independent contractor. Um, so as stated as the con in the control test, applying this control test, TDN and actually commission Mr. Thomas to specifically- what were, the five, um, what were the five points that Lord Phillips have set up um, to say that uh, these are the, the, the points that we need to consider if, um, in, in determining whether an independent contractor um, is in a relationship which is akin to employment to the extent that the, emplo the, the employer, so to speak, can be held vicariously liable for his conduct. Yes, my lady, so I will now list them out. The first one is that the employer will be likely to have the means to compensate more than the victim, um, to compensate the victim, sorry. The second one is that the tort has been committed as a result of activity being taken by the employee on behalf of the employer. 
The third would be employees' activity is likely to be part of the business activity. Fourth, that this created the risk of the tort. And five, that the employee will be, to a greater or lesser degree, have been under the control of the employer. Yeah, I'm, pretty, I'm, I'm quite convinced that all these five criteria have been satisfied on the facts of the case, uh, primarily because um, the, the um, Mr. Thomas essentially is doing something that is part and parcel of the business of the company, of, of the newspaper, right? Yes, my lady, I would like to refer you back to the moot problem, which stated that... Yes? Which stated that TDN commissioned Mr. Thomas to carry out this investigative work on a contractual basis. So if Mr. Thomas were to- Yes, yes. I, I, I mean, uh, th there is no doubt that he's, he is being contracted on a contractual basis, but that in and of itself would not exclude TDL from uh, being made vicariously liable if we follow the test set up by Lord Phillips in Cox and Minist uh, Ministry of Defense. My lady, I would like to point out the fact that TDN had no control whatsoever over how the interview was carried out. And even after the publication of TDN's daily tabloids and websites, it was albeit authored by Mr. Thomas. So this shows a certain degree of distance, a line being drawn between Mr. Thomas's work and TDN's publication. As such, we could infer that- uh, But are, are you? But surely TDN has a chief editor who could have asked Mr. Thomas whether he had sought clarification from Alfie. And um, they, they must be to a certain extent uh, uh, um, a bar that the, the editor themselves internally have to, have to uh, implement, right? Before um, a publication can go out in, in the public. So if, for example, an accus certain accusation is made against um, certain parties for alleged uh, sexual harassment, then um, the clarification must be sought. Oh, my lady. That person. Yeah, sorry, my lady. Um, in reference to, yeah. um, referring back to your statement just now, um, so Mr. Thomas here, we are arguing that he is an in independent contractor as it was specifically stated that he was commissioned um, by TDN and thus um, if he were to be an employee, this sentence would not have to have addressed us to especially take into concern that he is, um, he has been commissioned as an employee would have in the daily basis of his work, included this interview as part of his work. No, uh, my lady. Uh, yeah, I mean, you, you're, you're arguing as though TDL has no control, no editorial control of, uh, as to the publication of the report, that they will publish whatever Mr. Thomas uh, gives to them. Is that the, the point that you're trying to make? Is that the argument that you're advancing? My lady, I beg to differ. The argument that I'm advancing is that Mr. Thomas is, he may be to a certain, he is to a certain degree not under the control of TDN. As such, that degree is not sufficient to categorize him as an employee of TDN. Okay, I think we're going into- Sorry, but Council, after all, wasn't it TDN who commissioned Mr. Thomas to carry out the investigation anyways? Yes, my lady. As such, commissioned, um, it, he was commissioned, but he was commissioned as an independent contractor. As this would be, um, I would refer you back to um, the part that it was published by TDN by way of their daily tabloids and their website, but it was authored by Mr. Thomas. And as such, there is a fine distinction that is drawn between Mr. Thomas's work and the publication of TDN. Uh, my lady, may I continue with my submissions? Uh, yeah, because I feel like we're going in circles here because I, I think from, from my point of view, um, your argument will only work if um, TDN has no control at all as to what... Uh, <laughs> what will be published in the, the, in the newspapers, in their own publication, which to me does not make logical sense at all. But yeah, please proceed, yeah, continue. 
Apologies for interjecting. Before you continue, yeah. uh, Ms. Naomi Koo, your time has uh, far exceeded. Would you like to request for more time from Our Lady and Watchers? Um, my Lord and my ladies, may I request for um, one minute to sum up my submissions? Okay. Much obliged. So moving on to the second round that Mr. Thomas's act does not fall within any of the exceptions where an employer is liable for an independent contractor's tort. The first would be negligence of the employer. Here, um, there was obviously no negligence on the part of Mr. Thomas, and this may be differentiated from the case of DBKL and Ong Kok Peng, where the plaintiff badly injured after falling down a lift at the Pekaliling Fax. Here, failure to employ competent and skilled independent contractors and duty to take care is non-delegable. And the second point would be non-delegable duties, which as pointed out in the case of, in the UK Supreme case of, Supreme Court case of Woodland and Swimming Teachers Association, which laid down five features in order to determine whether it was a non-delegable act. So referring to our present case, journalism may not be categorized as a non-delegable duty as it does not meet such features laid in Woodland. So my Lord and my ladies, this concludes the defendant's submission on the second issue. Thank you, counsel. Okay. Uh, second counsel for the defendant, you may begin. Good evening, my lord and ladies. My name is Tan Ying Yi, appearing for the defendant, and as mentioned by my co-counsel, I will be addressing issue three. The defendant would be addressing the third issue provided in the light of the possibility that the court will find for the plaintiffs in the first issue. Here, we are trying to prove that even if the statements are definitory, the defendants will still succeed in this case as these are true facts and comments. The third issue is whether Ms. Grace, Mr. Thomas and TVN may successfully raise the defense of justification and fair comment to the action. Our arguments will be based on two grounds, namely the allegations are proved to be true and the four elements for the defense of fair comment have been met. My Lord and ladies, the defendants will now move on to address and submit the first round that the allegations are proved to be true. To raise the defense of justification, defined under Section 8 of the Defamation Act 1957, firstly, the allegations must be proved to be true. In Tong King Chai against Paul Carfin, the defense of justification had succeeded as there was evidence to show that the meeting minutes were in fact never disclosed. Next, there's no requirement to prove the truth of all allegations. A defendant will have sufficiently proven the defense of justification if he's able to prove the truth or the substantial truth of his own meanings of the impugned words, as stated in the Court of Appeal case of Sharika Bakalan Ayi Salangos Sindaran Bahat against Tony Parkin Wee. In this case, contents of the report were sufficiently true to allow the defense of justification to succeed, pursuant to Section 8 of the Defamation Act 1957. Referring to our case, the allegations could be proven through the fact that a police report was lodged and that she is a direct and that Miss Grace is a direct victim of his unwanted and inappropriate approaches, and hence her experience is said to be the testimony of his inappropriate acts. The fact that the plaintiff questions and increases the withdrawal of the police report and the absence of Miss Grace speaking of her sexual harassment experience in an interview as evidence to invalidate the defendant's experience, we as defendants submit. Would, in, would be invalid as the report could have been withdrawn for financial reasons or for fear of her own life. Apart from that, Mr. Thomas is said to be an investigative journalist. And sorry, say that again, counsel. Oh, sorry. Why was the police report withdrawn? For financial reasons or for fear of own, her own life. Can you elaborate more on both of the, the reasons you mentioned? So many survivors of sexual harassment would be prone to do so, meaning to um, withdraw the report, especially when they are in a less financial advantageous situation, as a court case would probably drag out to a few years and they would not have enough sufficient finances to sustain the whole case. Apart from that, they might also genuinely fear for the safety of their own life. They might fear for the- Yeah, I mean, counsel, this is rather speculative, right? Um, there's nothing on the- facts of the case that would indicate that was the reason why she withdrew the report? Yes, this was just a mere possibility to um, address what the plaintiffs had mentioned just now. Okay, what do you have to say about uh, the second 
uh, counsel for the plaintiff's contention that the standard um, to for the purpose of invoking justification in these type of cases, the standard's quite high. I think the words that she used is substantive proof uh, that a crime has been committed. So there must be at least a charge uh, being made against the person. What do you have? Legally speaking, do you think that that should be the standard? And if your answer is no, why? No, I would say that the standard is slightly a bit, a bit too high, especially for sexual harassment cases, as um, there's a need to dispense this stereotype where incidents related to sexual harassment often veer towards victim blaming, and many as many perpetrators would use this as a ground to invalidate the experience of the survivors, and hence um, this would result in many of the sexual harassment cases being subsequently swept under the rug just because they do the courts. I mean. They do not see the survivor's experience as evidence. Hence, I would say no, a lower standard should be implied. And when you say a lower standard, what do you mean by that? Um, the courts should admit what the experience of sexual harassment survivors as evidence. The, the, the court that is hearing the defamation suit, you mean? Yes. Okay. Proceed. Yeah. Apart from that, Mr. Thomas is said to be an investigative journalist and hence, as seen in the case of Datuk Suri Anwar bin Ibrahim against Utusan Melayu and another, it is stated that a journalist owes a legal, moral, and social duty to be careful and diligent in verifying statements before publishing them. And hence, we could infer from here that Mr. Thomas had verified the truth of Ms. Grace's statement prior to publishing it. Next, as stated in the case of Tan Sri Haris bin Muhammad Saleh against Dr. Shari Ida, intention is irrelevant as the presence of malice will not defeat the defense of justification. Referring to our case, even if there was malice on Mrs. Grace's end due to some personal grudges towards Mr. Alfie, it will not hinder the success of this defense. Lastly, in the case of Mukshuk Moi against Pervadanan Pengurusan Prisma Padana and another, it was held that slight inaccuracies will not prevent the defendant from succeeding in this defense. Sexual harassment survivors may experience some fragmentation of their memories, such as forgetting what time or which day it was committed. However, uh, Counsel, sorry to interrupt. I believe what the, your learned friend said earlier was that malice would defeat the defense of fair comment. I, I don't think she said that malice would defeat justification. So perhaps if you want to discuss malice, you can discuss it under the defense of fair comment. Uh, yes, my lord. Um, this, however, wasn't, wasn't posed to uh, as a, something to rebut what they say. It was just us supporting our case. It was just an element to support our case. Sure, we, we are quite convinced that malice is not required uh, for the purposes of, I mean, it's irrelevant for the purposes of justification. Okay, my lord. Um, if I may continue. It is also undeniable that Mr. Alfie is indeed the root of this trauma. If Grace were to raise the defense of justification, she would resubmit that she would succeed. Regarding Mr. Thomas, he would successfully raise justification too, as the content of the investigative report was based off Miss Grace's testimony. My lord and ladies, based on this ground, the defendants submit that the defense of justification would succeed. Moving on to the second ground, the defense of fair comment defined under Section 9 of the Defamation Act 1957 lays down the elements for the defense of fair comment, which is also seen in the case of Noor Asya Binti Mahmud and another against Randi Singh and another, which was subsequently reiterated in the case of Datuk Sri Muhammad Najib bin Tun Haji Abdul Razak and another against Muhammad Rafizi Rambi and another. The elements include, namely, the words complained of are comments, although they may consist or include inferences of fact. The comment is made on a matter of public interest. The comment is based on fact. And lastly, the comment is one which a fair-minded person can honestly make on the facts provided. The first element, as stated in the case of Joshua Benjamin Jayaratnam against Gaur Chok Pong, discusses whether the words complained of are comments, although they may consist or include inferences of fact. The test for this element laid down in the case of Miran Labai Marun and another against J. Muhammad Ismail Marikan and Straight Printing Works 
is whether an ordinary and reasonable man would classify the words as a statement of fact or, or comment. If comments and facts are mixed up, it is not an available defense. In Datuk Sri Muhammad Liza against Utusan Melayu, this defense had succeeded as the accusation that the Johor Sultan was using public funds and the expression that the plaintiff's statement resulted in public displeasure were both comments. If Miss Grace were to raise the defense of fair comment, she would succeed as what she stated in the interview was in the form of a comment of her uneasiness working in Shelby and Co., ultimately caused by the surroundings in her workplace, that of which includes the actions of the people at her workplace, specifically Mr. Alfie, which caused her resignation. The second element is that the comment made must be on a matter of public interest. In Henry Wong Jen Fook against John Lee and another, public interest would regard activities of people who are influential in a particular society. It is also referring to our case, it is stated that sexual harassment is a matter of public interest as it is a topic that has been heatedly debated upon recently, especially with the pressure to pass the sexual harassment bill. Besides that, Mr. Alfie is said to be someone who is influential in the society as he holds the position of a managing director in Shelby and Co. The third element is whether the element is based, the comment is based on facts. In S. B. Palmer against A. S. Raja and another, it was stated that only the facts which form the basis of the comment had to be proven, and hence not all facts will need to be proven. Referring to our case, Miss Grace's comment was based on facts as she was the direct victim of his acts. And lastly, the fourth element is whether the comment is one which a fair-minded person can honestly make based on the facts provided. Apart from that, Mr. Thomas is said to be an investigative journalist, and hence, as seen in the Datuk Seri Anwar Ibrahim, Bin Ibrahim against Utusan Malayu case, it is stated that the journalist owes a legal, moral, and social duty to be careful and diligent in verifying statements before publishing them. In Raja Gopal against Rajan, to rely on this defense, the comment must be fair and made an honest expression of the defendant in good faith. If a reasonable person were to experience the same unwanted approaches of Mr. Alfie towards her, they too would voice out similar comments. Lastly, there must be no malice for this defense to succeed. In Dr. Chong Ng Leong against Tan Sri Haris bin Muhammad Saleh, it was stated that the views expressed may be exaggerated, obstinate, or prejudiced, provided they are honestly held. All four elements, in addition to an absence of malice, must be proven for this defense to succeed as seen in the case of Tong King Chai against Ho Ka Fen. We could, referring to our case, there was no malice on Miss Grace's end as she has already resigned and hence would not be able to gain anything out of defaming Mr. Alfie. Further, no reasonable woman would put a target on herself by claiming falsely that they were victims of sexual harassment. Being in such a position would taint her own reputation as well, defaming herself too. Even if her views are biased, Due to the fact that she is a victim, this defense would not fail provided if they were honestly held, which in fact, they were. If Thomas were to raise the defense of fair comment, he too would be able to succeed as the report was based solely on the investigation TVN conducted, with Miss Grace being the subject of the state investigation. As such, the content of the report is true, as Miss Grace so testifies. The fact that Mr. Thomas was quoted to have hopped on this opportunity to publish a report on such a sensational scandal suggests that he did it purely out of motivation for cash, as it is his part. It is part of his job as an investigative journalist, alongside with an absence of facts on whether he had anything or any personal grudges against Mr. Alfie, showing a lack of malice on his end. I beg to differ with what the plaintiffs mentioned regarding the non-verification on part of the second defendant, as. If we submit that one were to inquire another on whether they had committed, giving an example, a corruption, if the answer is false, would this be considered as verification since the answer is inaccurate? Thus, the defendants respectfully submit that the defense of fair comment would succeed. Uh, Council, can I interrupt you for a bit? Do you have uh, any case law, any precedents from anywhere around the world, to be honest, any part of the Commonwealth, dealing specifically... Uh, on the case of defamation in the context of sexual harassment allegations and the defenses that arise out of that? No, my lord. Okay. Unfortunately not. Okay, so that means this is like the very first one that 
has come to the court of uh, Malaysian court for determination? No, there was um, a case which regards sexual harassment in workplaces, but our case here differentiates from that case as in that case, um, actions were taken within the company itself. And hence, um, since the facts of our case did not do not um, have an element similar to that, we decided to not include this in our statement. All right. So there is nothing in the context of a def a defamation suit being brought by the alleged uh, person who, who committed the wrongdoing. Yes, my lord. Okay. Thank you. Okay, um, my lord and ladies, this concludes the defendant's submission on the third issue. If I may be of no further assistance, we pray that the court will find in favour of the defendants and that the claim be dismissed with cause. Much obliged, my lord and ladies. Thank you, counsel. Um, can we hear from the, plain, uh, the rebuttal from the plaintiff? Much obliged. May it please the court, the plaintiff has a few points to make in reply. My learner opposing counsel contends that the headlines written by the second defendant was meant to attract attention and leaves imagine, imagination to the readers. In this point, the plaintiff would like to cite the case of Abdul Khalid and Party Islams in Malaysia, which held that whether the words are capable of defamatory meaning, the court will construe the words according to the fair and natural meaning, which will be given them by reasonable persons of ordinary intelligence. In this case, the defendants pleaded that the words were meant to be an entertainment. And the court in this case held that it is immaterial in determining whether the words were defamatory or not to, by looking at the intention of the defendants. If the tendency of the libel was injurious to the plaintiff, the defendant must be taken to have intended the consequence in his own act. The question of action of an action for words is not what the party use, using them considered their meaning by any reservation in his own mind, but what was meant to be have understood by the party to whom he uttered them. It's not what the defendant intended, but what a reasonable man, knowing the circumstances in which the words were published, would understood to be the meaning. Hence, it is immaterial of whether the second defendant intended it to be attracting attention of the reader. What is more important is what the readers may impute after reading the headlines and the context as a whole. The plaintiff would like to cite the case of Abdul Khalid again, which states that if the libel is contained in a paragraph or newspaper, not only the paragraph, but also the heading must be taken into account. The words themselves may appear innocent to, may be shown to have a defamatory meaning when they're read with reference to the circumstances in which they were written and with reference to the context in which they appear. And the plaintiff submits that a reasonable person would infer the defamatory implication from the context of the publication which constitutes an extrinsic fact, and down draw an inference for that. From the quote, it can be inferred that the plaintiff has disrespected the bodily autonomy and privacy of the first defendant by reading both the headlines and quotes together, as it will be reasonably understood by peer implication and inference by an ordinary person. Moving on to the issue of fair comment, my learned opposing counsel stated that there was no malice as the first defendant was acting in bona fide protection of his legitimate interest or voicing out her comment as a victim for the fear of safety of her own life and financial reasons. The plaintiff would like to draw a lordship's attention that this defense can be defeated once there is malice on part of defendants, regardless of whether the matter concerns a matter of public interest. The plaintiff submits that the defendant was actuated by malice because she still holds a grudge against the plaintiff and raised the scandal about her constructive missile in the interview, as aforementioned in our submission. The first defendant had a cause of action for constructive dismissal in the industrial court. If she had genuinely believed that she was constructively dismissed, she would have gone to the lodge of representation and the industrial relations and get a settlement for her dismissal from Shelby and Co. within 60 days of her resignation in accordance with the section 20 of the Industrial Relations Act. In the event that they have failed to come to an amicable settlement, she can further refer her matter to the Minister of Human Resources. Yes, so yes, Council. We are very, we are very aware of the process. Um, your point being that she should have pursued a claim for unfair dismissal. Yeah. Okay. Any other points? Is that all for your rebuttal? My lady, the plaintiff would like to submit another point. Yes. 
the defendants had stated that the first defendant did not satisfy the requirement that the words refer to the plaintiff as there was no reference to the plaintiff by name. The plaintiff submits that the words clearly refer to the plaintiff as the topic of interest of the interview carried out by the second defendant is about the plaintiff's inappropriate tendencies within the workspace. And hence, the second defendant reasonably knows that the statement was referring to the plaintiff in that situation. And besides, the plaintiff and the first defendant are heavily involved in the scandal. It is therefore reasonable for the second defendant to associate it with the plaintiff. Hence, it is submitted that there exists some external facts as the second defendant knew of the scandal prior to the interview. And imputing this knowledge and extrinsic fact that the plaintiff is the head of the company and that the topic of interview concerns the plaintiff, a reasonable person in that position would come to the conclusion that the words indeed referred to the plaintiff. Summing up, the plaintiffs submit that the requirements of defamation are still satisfied. The third defendant is liable for the second defendant's report and the defense of justification and fair comment should not be raised by the defendants. Much obliged. Thank you, counsel. Uh, defendant, your sorry button. My lord and my ladies, um, I would present the show rebuttals on behalf of the defendants. We, as, we accept the, state, that the statement is defamatory. However, the claim for defamation would fail as there was no reference. No context was given regarding the question posed and hence no assumptions can be made. Um, referring to the question, there was no, there was no mention on, although it was said that um, TDN was... The sorry, Miss Grace's interview was um subject was the subject of an investigation, uh into the per sorry, may I compose myself? Um, although it was stated that the interview was based was to was regarding information on Mr. Alfie's personal life and inappropriate tendencies within the office space, there was no evidence to show that it was indeed written in the article. Besides that. The claim for defamation would fail as there was no reference made to um, our defendants. Namely, in the first one, there was no ex in Miss Grace's case, there was no explicit mention on the name and hate, quoted hate, is vague and we cannot make any assumptions as, no, as there were no facts to support it. Besides that, even if there really was were to be a reference, it would be to Shelby and Co and not Alfie as it was referred to as a place and not a person. Besides that, for Mr. Thomas, Alfie's surname, age or job were not included and only the mere name Alfie was included. Hence, it is not sufficient to show that the Alfie in Mr. Thomas's headline was said to be the Alfie from Shelby and Co. Apart from that, we would still stand firm on our ground that there was no malice on part of our defendants. As for Miss Grace, that she already had resigned and would not be able to gain anything out of defaming Mr. Alfie. Apart from that, the the, def, the plaintiffs were had also had also mentioned uh, some the process regarding the industrial relations. However, we would we would submit that since she had no financial means to carry out a court procedure, how would she, she wouldn't be aware that she would be able to lodge a complaint regarding the process that it was mentioned by the defendant. However, nearly all of this was speculations. Uh, I mean, our assumptions made by us. Um, there was no malice on part of the plain, the, the defendants as, on Mr. Thomas especially, as um, he's, he was just carrying, he was just investing, the, the report made was just a part of his job and it wasn't, it didn't have anything to do with um, having personal grudges against Mr. Alfie. So um, with this, the defendants would like to submit our show rebuttals that the statement, the claim for defamation could not succeed and the defense of justification and fair comment would be able to succeed. Um, thank you, my lady. The Honorable Court is now adjourned. Judges, you will be invited into the judges deliberation room to deliberate. Participants, you will also be invited to wait in the participants holding room. You do not need to click anything from your end.
Rafiq, you might need to guide them to join back their breakout room for the participants holding, yeah? No worries, okay. Um, Sorry, am I supposed to be leaving this? Uh... Uh, yes, you should be moved. Uh, do not worry. You do not need to click anything, my lady. Thanks. Uh, yes, Miss Nicola, I've tried to... I think Miss Nicola is still in the main room. I'll try adding her in again. Yeah. Thanks. Do we need to fill up the score sheet or can you take the... <laughs> is uh, you have this uh, fill out the score sheets. You can fill it in the blue squares. Oh, you're muted, Charlene. Oh. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Yes, uh, you just need to fill out your scores in the blue squares and the comments. Please bear with us for a moment, participants, while we move you to the participant holding room.
Sorry about that technical difficulties. Uh, I hope everyone's back here. Yes, everyone should be back. Okay, hello everyone, welcome back. We would now like to invite the judges to give their comments. Um, thank you. Um, I think we'll start with Nicola first. All right, okay. First of all, I would just like to say a huge uh, congrats and good job to all of you. Um, uh, mooting is the first step and, and I just really want to applaud you guys for uh, taking this first step and giving it a shot. Um, so um, I just wanted to give some general feedback uh, on, uh, on your performance today. I think the first one is to always to remember to slow down. I think everyone always has this common tendency to speak fast, especially when it's something that you're excited about. When you're doing a mood, you are trying to forward your arguments. It's always very common to um, speak fast. Even us, uh, even me, myself as well. Sometimes in court, I have to remind myself as well to always slow down. So that's one of the comments that I have. The other one is, I would say, to not rely on your notes so much. Um, because uh, from just now, from, from, uh, from when you guys were submitting, we could see some of you guys were relying on your notes quite heavily. That's why when judges ask you a question, sometimes when you're being asked a question, you get caught off guard because you were, you, because you were relying on your notes. And when the judge asks you a question, somehow you just lose your ground and it becomes hard to, to gather your thoughts. So this is what I, uh, I, I, I would usually uh, advise is if even if you have to, if, even if you need to rely uh, on a lot of your notes, have a separate piece where you have all your key points. For example, just now, I think uh, uh, Ms. Chu Yi, she asked, uh, she asked a question. She asked, okay, so what is your strongest point? What is your main point? Always uh, have that in your mind that when you submit, you would want to put your strongest point first. Uh, do not wait uh, to, to list down all the authorities and all that. Put your strongest point out first. Um, and in terms of when you submit, it would be good to have head notes and give us a guideline as to how many points you will have. So let's say if, if you have finished your first point and you're moving on to the second point, just let the judge know, um, thank you, my lady, I'm done with my first point. If you don't have any further questions, I'm moving on to my second point, which is whatever. Then at least when the judge is listening, we know where you're going with the submission and it's easier to follow. Um, and then I think just the last one is just uh, when you're submitting as well, always make sure to maintain uh, eye contact with the judges so that you know whether they are with you or whether they are thinking or whether they are deliberating on something, whether, because usually, um, it's, it's easy to pick up on whether the judge is with you or not, depending on the demeanor. So it's always good to maintain that contact with the judge. Um, those are just the general comments that I have. I think uh, Arvin has uh, further some things to say as well. Hi, everyone. Uh, okay, like Nicola said, well done. And uh, congrats in particular to you four for reaching the final. I think that that's quite amazing. Uh, okay, first, thing that I really need to say is your presiding judge here is a lady, right? There, there are so many times where you all went like, my lords, my lords. I, I think I was quite annoyed. I'm surprised she wasn't, right? So it, it should have been rightly when you address, it should be my ladies and my lord. All right. So just always, always keep that in mind. Uh, okay. In, in terms of your submissions, I'll focus perhaps uh, generally on your content. What you all need to improve on, I believe, is focus. That means you need to focus your arguments to your key points and don't veer too, too much away from it, right? You're not very focused. You're trying to touch a lot of broad things at one go, uh, including trying to go on the realm of speculation, which is a no-no, all right? So you have that set of facts to work with. So just focus on those set of facts and focus on the areas of law that you want to, the points of law that you want to submit and focus on the application. And another thing is, uh, has to do with relevance. Quite a number of time, the, the panel actually didn't get where exactly you're headed. Why are you saying certain things, right? So it has to always be relevant to your submission. And if we can't follow the relevance, then no point. Because in my head, I, I don't know where you're heading to. And uh, that, that point is just lost. So make sure whatever point you have, 
is relevant and before that tell us why it is relevant especially when the interject can ask all right so i, I think that's only about the two points that i want to share with you guys in particular thank you thanks nicola ravin uh so um, like my two previous judges, uh, I would like to say congratulations and well done. I must say that it's a particularly uh, entertaining final round of moods. So I uh, will give specific feedback to each mooter. Um, I, I adopt the comments made by Nicola and Arabin. So my comments are in addition to the comments that, that they have made. So I think for the first uh, plaintiff, um, Liu Block Yi, so you would realize that the first question that I asked was how many points do you have? So this is very important because you need to map out your submissions. And for the other three mutas, when you see me doing that, what you should have done is immediately to prepare to do that as well uh, when, you, when you begin your submission. So why is it important for you to map out your points? It's quite simple. If I tell you to run five rounds versus if I tell you to run until I tell you to stop. Which one is which one sounds a bit more laborious? The latter, isn't it? Because uh, I didn't tell you where the end point is. So it's easier for the judges when you tell the judges at the outset that I have five points, so that we will then know where you're at in your submissions. Okay, so that's fundamental. Okay. Um, the second thing that I realized, um, you use this phrase, we are not on the same page. Um, I, I don't think that's quite proper in the context of uh, submitting before a court. Uh, I usually only use we are not on the same page when I'm arguing with my friends and I want to move on to the next topic. So I will never use it with a judge because you would want the judge to be on the same page with you. So even though literally you guys are not on the same page, it is your job to convince the judge so that the judge is on the same page with you. So you shouldn't be saying, oh, my lady, it looks like we're not on the same page. So that's not good. Okay. Um, now, the other point that I picked up is that um, this is when I ask you what are the external facts that you're using to address your, your, your to support your submission. And you said that, oh, uh, I do have external facts, but it's in the later part of my submission. Now, again, um, when, when a judge asks you a question and you already have the answer, although the answer is in the later part of your submission, you shouldn't wait. You should just give the answer. You shouldn't say it's in the later part of your submission. Okay, uh, so that's also quite fundamental. So those are my comments for uh, first plaintiff. Uh, second plaintiff, um, now uh, I, I like how you are, uh, among all the four motors, you are the, uh, you, the way you submit is like you're having a conversation uh, with the judges. So I think that is very important, uh, particularly if it's online submissions. Okay, uh, because it's very easy for the for the judges to lose you. So it feels like you're talking to me instead of reading uh, like a newscaster. Um, so what, what comment, uh, there are two comments that I want to make is this, is that firstly, um, when I ask, there, there, there's this one point when I ask you for, um, uh, for a case, whether or not asking for clarification, uh, failing to ask for a clarification is an evidence of a police. Okay, you totally, has the, you totally have the answer. You have the case on point. But you're too excited because you have the exact answer to my question. And then you just speak through the answer. So don't do that, okay? Um, so you have to be aware of your speed. Um, so I know you're excited because you have the answer to my question, but um, you have to have what is known as situational awareness, okay? The point is not to just vomit out your answer. But the point is to send, uh, to, to be able to uh, uh, articulate your answer properly. So you have the, you already have the answer. So there is no need to rush through your, your point, okay? And the second point is that your rebuttal, your rebuttal must be punchy and must be succinct. So I think the, the part that uh, annoyed me a little bit was that you were going on and on about the claim for unfair dismissal. In fact, you were setting up the whole process of uh, commencing a claim for unfair dismissal in Malaysia, which is not the point of your submission. The point of your submission is that she should have, if, if she was indeed, uh, if she felt that she was indeed uh, sexually harassed, then she, or rather if she felt that she was indeed 
uh, unfairly dismissed, then she should have filed a claim. That was your point. You could have just addressed that point in one sentence, right? So, but instead you went on and on. So uh, those are my comments. Uh, for Naomi, I think you have very good pace, uh, which is much welcome because both counsel for the plaintiffs were really, really fast. Um, now, um, did you have a script on your screen that you yes, were reading from? Uh, yeah, so because it's quite obvious, I can see your eyes. We, we all could see your eyes moving left and right. So uh, just, um, if you want to read out of the script, I don't recommend that, but don't make it so obvious. Yeah. Uh, also, you use the words, I beg to defer quite often. Um, I, I don't think you should do that as well for the same reason that I've explained to uh, Miss Liu just now, because uh, your job is not to defer from the bench, your job is to convince us. Okay. Um, now, uh, I, I think uh, this, is, uh, this is something that Aravi brought up, right? Like, uh, the, the issue of whether or not the court Grace's quote uh, was in the publication, okay? Uh, first, I, I feel that it's quite misleading for you to say that it isn't there, okay? So that's one point. Um, I think the second point is that it's quite obvious that we were not with you already on that point. We felt that the quote uh, from Grace was republished in the newspaper, but you keep insisting on that point. So what I'm trying to say is that um, do not flog a dead horse. When you see that a judge is already not with you on that point, don't keep pushing it, okay? Um, so, so, so that's quite important because it will only annoy the bench. Now, uh, da, 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 da. okay, uh, those are my comments for you. Um, final mutter, second mutter for the um, defendant. Um, good pace, uh, but you look very hesitant. When you're submitting, uh, like you're scared of something. Uh, I'm not sure what you're scared of because we are not that that, that scary, right, judges? Yeah. Uh, so, so you look very hesitant um, when you're when you're submitting. Um, also, I think you had a script on your screen as well because I could see your eyes moving left to right. Um, now, uh, that's one. And the, the the other reason why I I know that you have a script on your screen is that uh, the pace and the tone of the way that you talk, right? It differs from when you answer question. When you answer question, it's a bit more conversational, but uh, when you're submitting, it's like you're reading out of a script. Um, so you have to be a bit more consistent. Um, don't make uh, assumptions uh, and speculation based on facts. I think you did that a lot. Um, and in, in your submissions, there are certain points that the plaintiff did not bring up. Um, as a defendant or as a respondent, normally when you move, um, you don't have to argue points which the plaintiff didn't argue. You don't have to rebut the points that they didn't rebut. Okay, um, yeah. So I think I, I wanted to make two general comments as well. I think one of the, one of it, uh, Ara has already picked it up. Um, when you're addressing the, you need to get the, uh, you need to address the bench properly. But the second point is, uh, if you realize some of our questions, um, we, we are not interested only with what the law says, but also why is the law like that? Can you justify why is the law like that? So that for me, and, and I always say this, even to the mutters that I train, uh, what differentiates a good mutter from an excellent mutter is that an excellent mutter will be able to justify the law, the principles that they are presenting to the bench, uh, not just to tell us what the law is because Anyone can tell uh, the judges what the law is. It's a matter of telling the judges that the law applies and why the law applies and why the principles of law that you're articulating uh, are justified. So uh, those are my comments. Will there be no further okay. questions? Okay. Yeah. Will there be Unless no the mutters have any questions, <laughs> yeah. I presume no questions? Okay. Thank you, judges. We will now proceed with the photography session. Everyone, may I ask you to look into the cameras and smile. Three, two, one. One more. Three, two, one. Please bear with me for a moment while I verify the photographs. Our times have changed. <laughs> Taking a photo on a screen. <laughs> 
<laughs> this is the best you can do during this time. <laughs> yeah. Hopefully soon we can go back to physical moods. <laughs> we are all hoping yeah. to go back to court soon as well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. May I end the session? Thank you. Thank you, everyone. We have now come to the end of the grand finals of Taylor's internal mooting competition. For those of you who have joined us via the live stream, do stay tuned as we will commence the closing ceremony momentarily. Judges, you may now leave the meeting if you wish. Have a nice day. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks all. Judges.
everyone. Our closing ceremony will begin shortly. We're just waiting for all the participants to join back the call. So stay tuned. We will be live streaming the closing ceremony as well. And we will start shortly.
everyone, before we begin, if we could just get everyone to turn their cameras on, that would be great. Thank you. Okay, uh, welcome back everyone and welcome to the closing ceremony of the second Taylor's Internal Mooting Competition 2021. So before, I know everyone is very eager to hear the results, but before we go into the results, we'd like to take, take this opportunity to thank a few key players who have made this event possible. Firstly, of course, Taylor's Law School for giving us the opportunity to pursue competitions and events like this and allowing us to constantly grow despite being such a young club. Secondly, our mood master, Mr. Hacharan Singh, without whom none of this would be possible. He is the heart and soul of Taylor's Mooting Society, as anyone here will tell you. Without his wit and all his jokes and his care, none of us would be here today. Moreover, while he's here, we'd like to thank our founder, Amitesh Deva, who since starting this club two years ago in 2019 has offered us an insurmountable amount of support. In fact, for this very com competition, he drafted the mood problem and helped us judge two mood rounds. So we really do owe it all to him. And Shamin Fu, the captain of Taylor's Mooting Society, who was here with Amitesh when he started this club two years ago and has been here through all the ups and downs and has organized more events than any of us could ever top. So thank you very much to both Shamin and Amitesh for allowing us the opportunity and for creating Taylor's Mooting Society. We'd also like to thank the organizing committee, Shamin, Lian, Eng Hong, Adrian, Joe, Yongen, and myself for working tire tirelessly for the past two months and even more so for the past few weeks to make sure that this competition was able to run as smoothly as it did. We really hope that all of y'all had a wonderful experience and will continue mooting because we know that this is only the beginning of your mooting journey and we hope that you will all go very, very far and we are glad to say that we were a part of your journey. Now, before we move on to the results, I'd like to call upon Shamin, our, our captain, to give a short opening address. Over to you, Shamin. Thank you, Nimisha, for <laughs> that very lovely introduction. So good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. So I know uh, Nimisha has listed out a long list of people who we are grateful for, but I think I'll just thank all these people again, because really without all of you, we couldn't be here today. So just to kick things off, obviously we cannot um, do, uh, today would not have been possible without the support from the law school, especially Mr. Hacharan and Mr. Laiman On, who has helped us throughout this journey. We are also very grateful towards all the judges who spend their day off on a Saturday with us today in judging this moot competition. I'm sure our mooters have benefited from your guidance and feedback. Next, I'd like to thank my wonderful and very capable board of directors who have worked tirelessly from planning it since last September to what we have accomplished today. And these people are Nimisha, Adrian, Eng Hong, Jo Kao, Lian, Yong En. The next thank you goes to the founder of our Mood Society, Amitesh, for his contribution in drafting the Mood problem for today's competition. And of course, we could not have carried out the moots without all the help from our volunteers in assisting the moot rounds today. Last but not least, a big thank you to the participants for their interest in participating in today's competition. 
the reason why we started organizing internal moot competitions back in February 2020 is to allow and encourage aspiring mooters to venture into the world of mooting by letting them to moot in a competitive setting. We hope all of you had learned a thing or two during this competition and benefited through this experience. Regardless of today's results, I hope all of you take pride for taking this first step into mooting. I, for one, am very proud of each and every one of you for the courage you have shown in coming to Mood. The feedback we've gotten from the judges today have all been really positive and they are all very impressed with all your performances. I hope this is only the beginning and not the end of your mooting journey. So I may not be able to see everyone's faces, <laughs> but to prevent this from becoming a bedtime story, I'll pass this floor back to Nimisha and proceed with the award ceremony. Thank you. Okay, sorry, that was a slight technical difficulty. Uh, before we move on to the winners, one last group of people that we need to thank are the volunteers, students of Taylor's Law School, the bailiffs, assistant bailiffs and timekeepers who took the day off to help us out. And while I'm sure they learned a lot and had a great time watching all of you moon, we really wouldn't have been able to get this done without, it, without all of them. Uh, 17 of them ranging from semester one students to semester four students took the day off to come and help us and we are very very grateful for that so without further ado we are going to now announce the winners and all the all the prize winners of taylor's internal mooting competition so let's begin okay so oh and you guys are free to unmute yourself and clap if you like <laughs> In fact, uh, please unmute yourself and clap. <laughs> we obviously can't be there in person, but we want this to feel like a celebration as much as possible. Okay, so uh, next slide, please. Okay, so as we mentioned just now, because of how well all of you performed in this competition, we have updated from three speaker awards to five best speaker awards. So in fifth place, we have with a speaker score of 172 points. Drum roll, please. <laughs> Thank you. <Sorry. laughs> we have Joey Tan Shen In fourth place with a speaker score of 173 points, we have Yara Shweni. In third place, with a speaker score of 174 points. So as you can see, this is why we had to increase the number of speaker awards. Everyone was one, a one point margin apart from each other. So in third place, we have Joel Tan Hinkiat. In second place, with a speaker score of 177 points, we have Keanu Tan Kai Lung. Okay, we need more clapping, excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, okay, everyone, drum roll. I'm not going to start until I hear a drum roll. I don't hear anything, but that's okay. In With a speaker score of 182 points, we have Ang Yin Chia. Uh, all of y'all will, will be receiving medals when we are able to see you or get them delivered to you. So we will get in touch with you after the competition to give you your medals. Uh, moving on to what everyone is really here for. <laughs> the <laughs> winner of the second tennis internal mooting competition. Okay, Yara Shuni is in the waiting room. I think she missed out that she won <laughs> a speaker prize. That's okay. Uh, the champion of Taylor's Internal Mooting Competition 2021 goes to Team 200, 2, 200103, Liu Yi and Ng Yin the plaintiffs from the grand finals just now. 
they did a wonderful job and the judges were very, very nice about you in the deliberation room. Charmaine and I knew we were there. So yeah, y'all, y'all should be very proud of yourselves. Obviously then in second place will be Naomi Koo and Tan Ying Yi on the defendants. And now for our newly introduced prize, the second runner up, and we really had to give out this prize because of how well they did. They, we literally had no other choice but to give them a prize because they performed so well in this competition. Team 200, is it gonna appear? Eng Hong? <laughs> Team 200106, Joey Tan and Keanu Tan Kalo. So all of y'all get trophies as well. So we will give them to you as soon as we are able to. Y'all really did a wonderful job. Thank you everybody for participating. We hope you learned something and we hope you were able to take away a really, really good experience and good memories of this competition. So if all the participants would please stay back, we'd like to take a group picture and just have some last words with you. Thank you everyone for watching and supporting us on YouTube. We hope um, you had a good time and uh, I'll pass it on to Shamin, who I think wants to say something. Oh, no, just uh, all, all of you can stay back because we are. if you would like to know your ranking throughout the competition, you may we'll show it to you after we end the live stream. So uh, give, a, give us a moment to end the live stream and we can check on that. All right. <laughs>